From the CPRI Knowledge Hub and CPRIHub.org, this is Research Minutes, a deep dive into new and important research in the realm of education. Today, we take a fresh look at a landmark study of the American teaching workforce, examining 30 years of trends and data to determine where we are and where we might be going. The sheer growth in the number of teachers presents a large bill overall to the nation that you have far more teachers than you're used to and you have far more teachers per students. We welcome Richard Ingersoll, internationally renowned researcher and professor with the University of Pennsylvania Graduate School of Education. Ingersoll joins CPRI director Jonathan Sapovitz to discuss his new edition of the Landmark 7 Trends Study, which examines the ongoing transformation of the teaching workforce in areas like teaching experience. The numbers of beginning teachers surged from about 60,000 in the late 1980s, now up to over 190,000. Gender and racial diversity. No, we don't have parity, but there's been some success and it does suggest that all these minority teacher recruitment initiatives have maybe worked. And teacher turnover. The turnover of teachers is about double of that of professors, and it's higher than than lawyers and engineers and architects and accountants. Ingersoll discusses these and other trends and provides some important takeaways for those hoping to understand and make use of the latest data on America's teaching workforce. That's right now on Research Minutes. Good morning. This is Jonathan Sapovitz, the executive director of the CPRI Knowledge Hub, and I'm here this morning with Richard Ingersoll from the University of Pennsylvania, also a CPRI colleague. We're here to talk about a report that was just released at the very end of 2018 called Seven Trends, the Transformation of the Teaching Force, and it was updated from a previous report that Richard had done. So this examines 30 years of trends in the teaching force. Richard, it's great to have you here. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me, John. So, Richard, how did you come to do this study? It all began several years ago when I had a colleague who said, well, Richard, you've been studying the elementary secondary teaching force for quite a while. And has it changed at all? Is it undergoing any kind of changes? And I thought that's a good question. And I had a couple thoughts in my head. And But it prompted us to start to look at the national data over time to see well, in what ways has a teaching force changed or not changed over time? And what we discovered is it's actually changed dramatically and with very big implications. And some of the changes we discovered, we were surprised to find. And what's interesting is that while this very large occupation, elementary, secondary teaching is one of the largest occupations in the nation, one of the largest workforces in the nation, and it's undergoing these big changes, but A lot of them no one has really been aware of or on top of, and we think they will become so because a lot of these changes raise big questions and have big implications. Can you give us a sense of the magnitude of this workforce that we're talking about? Well, there's about 4 million teachers Uh, elementary, secondary teachers in the country. And it's a very large workforce. There's about five times as many teachers as either lawyers or professors. And there's far more teachers, for instance, than nurses, which is another very large occupation. So we're really talking about a, a major part of the profession in the United States. Yes. What's the source of your information? We've been mostly using a large national survey of teachers done every several years by the U.S. Department of Education. It's called the Schools and Staffing Survey, and it's a really terrific source of information. A very large sample, large-scale questionnaire given to teachers across the country. That sounds like a fantastic source. So the first a trend that you notice is what you call the ballooning of the teacher labor force. And can you describe what that is? Well, this surprised us. We discovered that the teaching force has been growing in size over the last 30 years. This really started in the mid-1980s, and it's not entirely new. After World War II, when we had the baby boom, the teaching force increased. There was a lot of hiring done to accommodate the surge in students. And then it slowed down in the 1970s as the baby boom graduated out of elementary and secondary schools. And then it picked up again in the 1980s, but picked up with one big difference now. Now, which is that the teaching force has been growing far faster than the student population in this country. Really, it over double the rate. And that raises all kinds of questions for us. Why? Why is the teaching force going up so much faster than the student population? And it also raised the, the so what question the implications issue, which is that, my gosh, I mean, how is this being paid for amongst other things? What's going on here? When will this continue indefinitely? How can the numbers of employees in a given industry increase so much faster than the client base, if we want to use that terminology? And those are big questions. 
those really are big questions. So there's a lot of things that we could hypothesize are contributing. What did you discover? We discovered that there's a number of factors going on. So in some states, there's been class size reduction over the last couple decades, California notably, and mostly at the elementary school level. So when you decrease the class size, you have basically more teachers per students. And so that's been one factor, but that's only explained a small part. Another part explained has been an absolute huge ballooning surge in two fields, special education and English as a second language or bilingual teachers. And those those are really surging fields and they account for also a bunch. And there's also interesting enough been an increase in the numbers of math science teachers. And this has partly been driven by the fact that over the last few decades, the average number of math and science courses required to graduate from high school has gone up. Well, if you're going to require more courses in math science, you're going to have more students taking math science. You're going to have to hire more teachers in math science. So there's there's several factors that have contributed to this big increase. Although to tell you the truth, no one's ever really been able to fully explain the surging. And of course, I really don't understand understand how it's being paid for. Hmm, Interesting. That gets to a second trend that you examined, which looks at the age of the teacher workforce, which you call the graying of the teacher workforce. And that's a trend that we've seen previously. But what did you discover more recently about the graying of the teaching workforce? We discovered that it's actually largely over. It's winding down. And that's an interesting story because we've been hearing about this aging of the teaching force now for several decades. Indeed, it's often posed as a major major reason for teacher shortages, that we're losing this baby boomer generation of teachers. And it has been true, but it's really sort of hit the peak and now on the way down. That, And we have some data showing, for instance, the numbers or percentages of teachers that are age 50 or over, that's hit the peak and that's going down. So there's still lots of older teachers there in this large teaching force, but that's declining. And that brings us to the third trend, which is a greening of the teacher workforce. And I assume this is not referring to using cleaner energy, but it's actually a youth movement in the teaching workforce. Yes. Interesting enough, what we discovered is that rather than more grain, we have this opposite trend. And the reason for this is that there's been so much hiring of teachers over the last several decades. As I mentioned, the teaching force going up faster than the student population, that the surge in hiring has meant that there's been a whole lot of new teachers coming in, inexperienced teachers. And of course, over time, they gain experience, but there's been this surge. And so what's happened is that the ratio, the balance between more senior teachers and more junior teachers has changed dramatically over the last several decades. What's the average or the most frequent years of experience of a teacher these days? Just to give you the comparison, so for instance, in the late 1980s, the modal teacher was about a 15-year veteran. That is that you had a lot of 15-year veterans and you had smaller numbers who had more experience and smaller numbers had less experience. It was kind of a, a mountain. If we flash forward to 2016, the modal, the most common teacher, was someone in their first through third years. The numbers of beginning teachers surged from about 60,000 in the late 1980s now up to over 190,000. So this is what we mean by greening, that there's this massive increase in beginners in this line of work far outweighing the numbers of veteran teachers. And so there's this whole change in the balance and the ratio between beginners and veterans. So the first trend was the growth in the number of teachers. And you explained that there were several areas that within teaching that were gaining more teachers. And here you're talking about teachers with less experience. Is there a connection between those two? You know, you said, how are we paying for the growth in the teacher workforce? There is an interesting connection financially. So the the sheer growth in the number of teachers presents a large bill overall to the nation that you have far more teachers than you're used to and you have far more teachers per students. That's expensive. We've tried to actually calculate what the cost of the nation has been. But the greening has an opposite effect that you have far larger portion of your teaching force that are on the lower end of the salary scale. And so that somewhat mitigates that you have more teachers. Nevertheless, when we've tried to do these calculations, the total increase in costs of this ballooning to the nation has been, you know, in the $40 billion range kind of thing. It's, it's quite expensive. 
Richard, the fourth trend that you talk about is changes, I guess, in the male-female breakdown of teaching. And I know that teaching has traditionally been a female occupation, but Richard, what have you found about differences between men and women inside of the teacher labor market? Well, we were surprised by what we found. And you're right that historically, teaching was set up as women's work quite intentionally when the public school system was found. Before then, teaching had been a male job, and it was pretty rapidly, for a number of reasons, created as a a female occupation, predominantly when the public school system was founded over 100 years ago. However, in the last several decades, all kinds of professions and occupations that were traditionally male-dominated have opened up to women. And so there was a fear that, gosh, teaching is no longer going to have this captive labor supply, so to speak, particularly the most talented and the best and brightest, so to speak, of females. And females had other uh, options, career options, so there'd be this decline. And actually, the opposite has happened, that the proportion of teachers who are female has continued to go up over the last 30, 40 years, and it's now past the three quarters mark. And if it keeps going, within a number of years, eight out of 10 of all teachers are going to be female. What do you hypothesize is behind that growth? That is a great question, and no one quite really knows. One idea, one argument, one hypothesis is that there's been a huge increase in the proportion of adult women who are full-time in the workforce, and that even though there's all kinds of other occupational options out there, just the sheer numbers of women now full-time in the workforce has meant an increase in teaching. But interestingly enough, we find that the rate of increase of women in teaching has been faster than the rate of increase in women in the workforce as a whole. So that doesn't really account for it. It's, It's almost as if teaching has increasingly become an occupation of choice for women. No one quite knows why this is. One hypothesis we have is that perhaps teaching might be more amenable to the tension, the difficulty of balancing family and career, which is a much, much discussed topic for women these days. And there's a whole large literature of books on, you know, how to be the super mom and how to balance children and family and also job and career and the difficulties of doing this. And and it's clear that some occupations and professions might, the balance might be easier than others. And so one hypothesis is that since you're only teaching part of the day and you're only teaching part of the year, that maybe elementary, secondary teaching, it might be easier to bring about a a better balance or at least diminish the imbalance of these two things in one's life. That's fascinating. The next trend that you examined was really the question of, is teaching more diverse than it used to be? This is a very important and large topic. And over the last couple of decades, there's been a great deal of discussion about a minority teacher shortage. And the argument goes like this, that America's becoming increasingly diverse along racial ethnic grounds, but the teaching force isn't. And the phrase we often hear is that the teaching force doesn't look like and decreasingly looks like America. And so as a result, there's been a lot of concern and a lot of initiatives to recruit more minority candidates into teaching. And two-thirds of the states have various types of minority teacher recruitment initiatives. And so we started to look at this and see, well, what has happened to the balance between minority and non-minority teachers over the past several decades? And what we discovered is, and it's an interesting finding and perhaps a controversial finding, which is that, yes, it remains true that we don't have parity. That is, that the proportion of students who are minority is greater than the proportion of teachers at minority. That remains true. But on the other hand, there's been an unheralded victory. There's been a great increase in the numbers of minority teachers in this country. It's really been a very significant increase. And indeed, over the last 30 years, the number of minority teachers has been going up significantly faster than the numbers of minority students. And of course, the numbers of minority teachers have been going up many times faster than the numbers of non-minority teachers, white, non-Hispanic teachers. So no, we don't have parity, but there's been some success. And it does suggest that all these minority teacher recruitment initiatives have maybe worked. And this story is all the more remarkable because it also turns out, and this is a second finding from our research, which is that minority teachers have distinctly higher quit rates 
than do non-minority teachers. And so this increase in minority teachers is really quite remarkable, given that it's in the face of these higher quit rates. One of your last trends is the turnover rates or the instability of this particular segment of the labor market. And so what are the trends in terms of churn in teacher labor? Well, there's several things. First of all, teaching is a relatively high turnover line of work compared to many. So for instance, the turnover of teachers is about double of that of professors, and it's and it's higher than, than lawyers and engineers and architects and accountants. So that also varies across types of teachers and types of schools. And so amongst the highest rates of turnover, and turnover in, includes both moving between schools and also getting out of teaching altogether, highest rates are amongst minority teachers, which we mentioned, and also amongst beginning teachers. And what we found is that these relatively high rates of quitting have slowly but surely gone up over the last several decades. It hasn't been a dramatic increase, but it certainly hasn't gone down at all. And it's particularly high amongst these groups. So amongst minority teachers, the quit rates are not only higher than non-minority teachers, they've also gone up over the last several decades. Since your data stretches back 30 years, is the change in instability at all associated with the rise of high stakes testing, which would be the 90s, I guess? It's hard to say what's driving that. Certainly, we've done some research on this question, and the whole accountability movement does have a relationship to teacher turnover, particularly in those low-performing schools. And this is going back to No Child Left Behind Act. If you were continuously low-performing, there was various sanctions and sticks and carrots involved. Those were uh, related to the higher turnover rates in those schools, and it's teachers either getting out of those particular schools and going to others, or those getting out of teaching altogether. So there's some connection there, but it's hard for us to say what's behind the long-term trends in instability. The last trend that you looked at is the academic ability of teachers over time. And what did you use as a measure of academic ability and what did you discover? Well, we used a measure where we get the name of the teacher's undergraduate college or university they went to. Almost all teachers have an undergraduate degree. And we looked at the selectivity ranking of those, all the way from sort of Ivy League, very selective at the top, all the way to very open, unselective at the, at the bottom, so to speak. And we looked at the proportion of teachers that got their degree at the, at the most selective colleges and universities. It's something of a rough measure of their academic achievement, because after all, there's a strong correlation between the selectivity of the college you went to and your SAT, your college entrance exam scores. The conventional wisdom is, is that when all these other once male-dominated lines of work opened up to women, that teaching would no longer have first dibs, so to speak, on the most academically able women from college. And so there was a prediction that sort of the academic ability of female teachers in particular have been going down over time. And that's not actually what we found. We found that there hasn't been much change. There really hasn't been a strong downward trend at all in the proportion of teachers, female teachers, new female teachers that got their degree in top colleges and universities. It's really, it's been pretty stable over time. This is fascinating work and amazingly illuminating about these larger trends of what's happening in this huge sector of not only the economy, but the education profession. What I'd like to ask you last is, based on what you're learning, what's the trend of your research? What's the next thing that you're going to examine based on what you've discovered here? One of the things about this project is, is it raises more questions than answers. It began as an exploratory project just to see, well, what changes have there been, if any, in this very, very large teaching force? And we discovered a bunch of these big changes. And, and for each one of them, there's two big questions. There's the why question, you know, what's behind the ballooning of teachers? What's behind the increase in the proportion of teachers who are female, et cetera? So there's the why questions. And then there's also the implications, the so what question. What's been the implications for the finances of the ballooning? And what are the implications for students if, if soon eight out of 10 of all teachers are women? Is it good? Is it bad? And the truth is we, we've tried to start to, to drill down on some of these questions, but a lot of most of them remain unanswered. And as far as we can tell, no one really knows 
knows the answers to a lot of these questions. Uh, no one's really been on top of these things. And so that's what we'd like to look into more and more, the, the different kinds of trends and why they happened and and do they matter? And we think that these questions are going to become all the more pertinent because we don't see these trends going away. They've been increasing. And as you mentioned in the beginning, this this latest version of our report is is an update with more recent data of something we published four years ago. And what we found is all the trends have continued. And so, uh, so we, we see this as completely relevant to sort of try to explain these things. Richard, this has been really illuminating. Thank you so much for sharing your time with me and the audience of the CPRI Knowledge Hub. Thanks a lot for having me, John. It was a, it was a pleasure. Thanks for listening to this episode of Research Minutes, presented by the CPRI Knowledge Hub. For more episodes or to subscribe to the series, visit us at cprehub.org. That's cprehub.org. To share your thoughts on today's episode or suggest future topics, follow us on Twitter at CPRI Hub. 